Good morning. Welcome to Faith and Victory Church. Hallelujah. How many out there hail Jesus as our king? Yay. Okay. Me too. <laughs> We 
Mr. Dick for that. Couldn't help but think at the beginning when he was practicing, I thought about an old uh, YouTube video I saw years ago. It was called like One Man Band. And as this guy had like this drum set on his back and had the guitar, had like a keyboard attached to the guitar and he's just going around, he's controlling the drums with his legs and it was pretty crazy, but that's what I thought about with <laughs> the One Man Band today. So maybe next time you can treat us to something like that. <laughs> So, let me pass this off. Thank you. All right. Well, who's happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. 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 Uh, as you guys know, uh, Pastor and Miss Janie have been uh, pretty much going around the whole country. 
for the past few weeks. And so uh, we're glad that they got some time off and they're able to rest a little bit, um, come back refreshed and um, you know, ready to minister more. I know, you know Pastor hasn't really done this, taken extended time off. Pretty much the whole time he's been in ministry. Um, so you know, it's definitely needed, definitely wanted for him. And um, you know, we're glad he's able to do that. Um, speaking of all the time that Pastor has been in ministry, this Sunday we're celebrating Pastor's 40th year in ministry. Um, and that is a feat. <laughs> Amen. Um, to be in the ministry for 40 years, to be doing the service of the Lord, and you know, doing everything that he's been asked to do by the Lord is definitely something to be celebrated. And so uh, definitely want you guys to stick around after service on Sunday. Um, Pastor will be back next Sunday uh, giving the message, and then yeah, we'll be next door uh, doing our uh, celebration of that. Um, so Jess has sent out a link to you, to you guys to sign up for, um, you know, bringing drinks or food or whatnot. Um, ask that you take a look at that, and, you know, if you're able to, please, um, you know, commit to giving us or getting us some food uh, for that celebration. I believe we've taken care of the cake, and it's going to be really good. Um, same place that did our wedding cake. So it's going to be really good. We're excited about it. Um, so definitely fill that out. If you haven't gotten that link, um, talk to Jess um, after service, and she can get that to you. Uh, remember, that is good. All right. That is next Sunday after service. All right. So that brings us to this morning's tithe and offering. And so uh, Mr. Joe uh, will be out and about if you need an envelope uh, for a cash or a check offering and all that. Um, so we know that the word says that, you know, given it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together and running over. Uh, men shall be given, men shall give into your bosoms. They'll open the windows of heaven, all that good stuff, right? And so each time we make an offering, each time it's, you know, whether it's financial, whether it's through prayer, it's through service, whatever it is, we're sowing a seed, right? We're sowing a seed. And of course, what that seed produces is based on what kind of seed is planted. So if you fa plant financial seeds, you will reap financial rewards, right? And so that's one of the commandments from God is our tithe. Uh, one of the things that we should be doing is the offerings so that we can continue the work of the church and continue the mandate of God uh, throughout our city, throughout our country, giving to missions, whatever that is, um, with these offerings. And so um, if you have that ready to go, go ahead and collect that. Or if you're giving online, that's awesome as well. All right, so let's go ahead and pray over that. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, the people here and their um, willingness to, uh, and obedience to give to you and to this church. Uh, we thank you that they are blessed beyond measure for the seeds that they have planted. And Lord, we just ask that you bless this service as we go through. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, for this message that you have given me to give to your people, and I just pray that you will be um, with us in this service, and you'll direct wherever we need to go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Um, so a little disclaimer on this message. Um, I have preached this message before. Um, and it was about, actually, I think it was before me and Jess got married. So this is about seven, maybe eight years ago. If you've been here for a while, you've probably heard this one before. Um, but I promise you it's not exactly the same as it used to be. I've made some revisions and gotten a little bit better with it. So there'll be some old stuff and some new stuff, but it's all good stuff, right? Yeah. Amen. Uh, at least I think so. So, <laughs> um, so with this sermon... Um, there's so many different ways you can go with this illustration. Um, and honestly, I'm still not sure which direction I'm going with it just yet. Um, I'm hoping when we get to that crossroads point, I'll kind of have a better idea of where I need to go. Um, so be praying for me on that one, please. <laughs> and um, we'll go from there. Um, as you guys know, though, you know, I'm a history teacher um, here in Guilford County Schools. And so I have a love for history. And so I'm going to be looking at a historical example, as well as like geography and stuff like that that kind of help us get through this. Um, so, uh, Ms. Belinda, do you have that first slide that I gave you up? All right. 
So I don't know if you guys have ever heard about this place. Um, it is a desert in South America. It is called the Atacama Desert. Anybody ever heard of it before? You have, yeah. <laughs> um, so the Atacama Desert, as you can see in this picture, what do you notice about the picture of the Atacama Desert? Very dry, right? So dry that the ground is cracking, no water, all that stuff, right? So what's significant about the Atacama Desert in you know, world geography and all that stuff is that it is considered by some to be the driest place on planet Earth. Um, there's some weather stations in the desert who have never in history recorded a drop of rain. Okay, that's pretty significant, right? Okay, um, so very, very dry place. Um, the way it's set up, the way it is on the west coast of South America, it's just kind of like a perfect conglomeration of bad weather stuff. <laughs> Which is why it doesn't happen, why they don't get rain too often. Okay? Um, there's a you know, phenomena that happens above the desert and the atmosphere that just doesn't allow for rain to fall to the earth. Uh, I won't get into all that, but <laughs> it's pretty interesting if you want to check it out. You know, but, um, point being, very dry. Right? Um, and so, the name of this sermon is Out of Dry Places. Okay? Has anybody ever been in a dry place before? So let's start, actually, let's start physically. Has anybody actually ever been to a desert? Been through a desert? Okay? They're not very fun, are they? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's wild. It's hot. It's dry. You feel miserable. It's like, if, if, you know, if hell is anything like this, I don't want to be there, <laughs> right? And of course, we know it's going to be like, you know, 100 times worse than that, but, you know, I can't imagine, all right? So, not a place that you definitely want to be. But obviously, you know, symbolism, you know, in spiritual things, we all get in dry places, right? Right? We get to a place where it just feels like we're at a standstill. It feels like there's no nourishment. There's nothing around us to get us out of this place. We're just kind of sitting there, standing still, right? And I've had several of these in my life. I'm sure you have had several of these points in your life as well. Um, and so I want to talk about a guy who came from a literal dry place, okay? So we're going to go back to Old Testament, 2 Samuel. All right, 2 Samuel chapter 4. You know, as I said before, you know, like, I love history, and so I look at the Old Testament as just this big history book, right? See, like, the history of the church, the history of, you know, uh, the Jewish people, the history of that part of the world. Um, there's never been an archaeological or a historical discovery to ever discount anything that happened in the Bible. Did you guys know that? So we know it's truth, right? Absolutely. Okay? So there's never been anything to ever disprove this. So we know that these things happened. We know that these are real people. We know that these are real events. So in 2 Samuel chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 4. And actually, let's give a little context to this first. So this is taking place uh, not long after Saul and Jonathan have died. They've been killed in battle. As you guys know, you know, Saul was the king of Israel, the first king of Israel. Uh, the people of Israel cried out to God saying, hey, every other nation around us has a king. We want one too. God said, well, you probably don't want that, but, you know, he tried to basically talk him out of it, but eventually they said, yeah, we want one. So he said, okay, here's Saul, here's your king. The person that he's anointed to be the leader of Israel, right? So the spirit of God was with, you know, Saul. Um, of course, Saul did some things that, you know, got messed up, and we'll talk more about that later. But they went to battle, Saul and his son Jonathan, and they both fell in this battle. And who was it that was supposed to become king after Saul? David, right? Okay. So Saul dies, Jonathan dies. David is now the king of Israel, according to God, right? So here in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame at his feet. 
He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. I'm terrible with pronunciations, just so you guys know. I tell my students this all the time. We start talking about ancient China and Japan, and if I don't say it right, I'm sorry, but this is what I got, right? So Mephibosheth, that's the guy's name. So Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. His nurse really freaked out when she found out that Jonathan and Saul had died. Took Mephibosheth and fled out of their home. Why would she do that? Why would she take Jonathan's son and flee quickly out of that area? Say again? Thought who was going to kill him? Okay, so in history, we see any time we have a new regime come in to a country, a new leader or a new family or anything like that comes to take over an area, they have a period where they have to what's called consolidate their power, right? Because naturally, in the natural order of a monarchy or anything like that, who should have become king after Saul and Jonathan died? A son, right? A relative, a family member. In this case, it would have been Mephibosheth. Naturally, he should have been the next king of Israel, or he should have been in line for the king of Israel. Does that make sense? All right, so she's afraid that David or his men are going to come and find him and kill him so that he does not have a claim to the throne later on. Okay? So at this point, he's five years old. All right? He's five years old. His nurse takes him. They flee out of town. And some, something happened on that journey where he was dropped, whether it was from a chariot or from a horse. We don't know what it was, but he fell, and the Bible says he was lame in both of his feet. So that means he couldn't walk. He was disabled in some way by that fall that he could, not, he could no longer walk, he could no longer do those things. Okay? So out of fear, she leaves. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, naturally should be king, but obviously God said David's going to be king, so he will be king, right? Nurse flees, scared, and all that. All right. So... We're going to skip a little bit here. Um, so in chapter 4, the rest of chapter 4, um, after uh, we talk about Mephibosheth, now he's just kind of mentioned here for a second, okay? And the reason he's mentioned here is because before this and after this, there's a lot of people dying. There's a lot of people who are loyal to Saul and loyal to Jonathan who are basically being taken out. Okay, David's consolidating his power to make sure that there's no... no you know, even though God said so, are people going to listen? Not necessarily, right? Okay? So, he's doing what, he, what you know, the natural order of things in the natural world, he's taking out people who would have a claim to the throne. And it started off with his generals and all this other stuff, so there's a lot of people who are being dying. So, she had a legitimate reason to be fearful. Okay? In chapters 5 through 7 of 2 Samuel, we see David consolidating his power even more. And he's going out, he's defeating all the ites and the, and the Philistines and the, all these people, right? He's having all these big battles. And so there's years between chapter 4 and chapter 9 where we're going to go to next. Okay? So there's a lot of years that go on here. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we have verse 1. Now Daniel, or sorry, now David said, is there still anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Okay. So, the way I kind of read this is, again, there's probably about 20 years in between chapter 4 and chapter 9. David's fighting all these battles, and he's finally at a point where he's, like, resting and saying, he, he remembers something, okay? He remembers something in his head, and he wants to know, is there anybody left from Saul 
from Saul's household that I can show kindness to. But not for Saul's sake, but for whose sake? For Jonathan's sake. Why for Jonathan's sake? What's that? They had a blood covenant with each other. Okay? When you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 20, they cut covenant with each other. Jonathan and David basically said that they were going to protect each other, that David was always going to love Jonathan's and his household. Okay? Now, I know pastors talked a lot about covenants before, and I'm not going to get too much into it, but a covenant back then, we have no idea what that actually meant today. Like, we have no comprehension of what that actually meant. Because we talk about, you know, promises and covenants and stuff today, and they're easy to break, right? You go into contract with somebody, we decide, no, we don't want to do that, we can break that contract easily, no harm, no foul. And a blood covenant in this context if somebody does not fulfill their part of the, the covenant, the other side is obligated. Not, the, not has the option, but they are obligated to kill that person. And basically their family. So David has made a huge, huge commitment with Jonathan. But he's sitting there after all these battles, and he's thinking to himself, there's got to be somebody there. Because I promised, I made covenant with Jonathan that I would protect his family. I would protect and show kindness towards them. You guys see where I'm going with this? Yeah. Okay. So, he remembers his covenant with Jonathan and begins searching for any relatives of Jonathan. So the only one we know about is who? Mephibosheth. <laughs> that guy, right? Mephibosheth. All right, so continuing on in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Verse 2. There was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show ki the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Mechir, the son of Emil, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought, out, uh, brought him out of the house of Mechir, the son of Emil, from Lodabar. Now, Lodabar literally means a nothing town or nothingville. That's how we've seen it before. There's nothing there. Or a dry place. So you guys... There's a connection there, right? All right, gotcha, all right. So, he's literally been living in a dry place for a long time, okay? And I'll show you how I know it's been a while here in just a second. Okay, so verse 6. Now, when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his feet and prostrated. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but prostrated means like basically falling on your face in full submission, um, as if you're not worthy sort of thing, okay? So I can imagine at this point in time, Mephibosheth had these people searching for him, almost like the Secret Service or FBI or something, going out to Lodabar to find this guy, brought him back to the king. In his head, he's got to be thinking what? They finally found me. They're going to take me out, right? So he's going in very humbly, right, and probably very fearful. So they bring him in, he falls on his face, and um, then David said to him, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. So Jonathan said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. So at this point, I can imagine a big sigh of relief coming from him, right? Whew. <laughs> okay. I'm going to focus on that for Jonathan, your father's sake. It wasn't anything Mephibosheth did, was it? It was nothing that he did. David had a covenant with Jonathan, and all of Jonathan's heirs are going to be beneficiaries of that covenant that they had. Right? 
Have we not seen a lot of this type of thing throughout the Bible? God's covenant with Abraham. God's covenant through Jesus. Did we do anything to deserve our salvation? To deserve our healing? To deserve our prosperity? Any of those things that we have? No. God is showing us kindness for Jesus' sake. For the sacrifice that he made, the covenant he made with himself. Right? It's pretty powerful, right? Pretty incredible. And so that just goes to show you how powerful this covenant was between Jonathan and David. He did nothing to earn what's about to happen to him. Um, so, yeah, do not fear, for I, will surely sh- for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the lands of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth and a dry place. Nothing town, Israel, Right? It's taken to the king, in front of the king. He thinks this is his this is day of death, right? But what happens? Set free, he fully restores him back to where he was. Right? Incredible. Right? How, I don't know if I want to go that way. Hold on, sorry. How many times have we felt that we were not worthy to go in God's presence because of something that we've done, right? But remember, it's not what we have done. It's what Jesus had done for us. Everything through that blood, through that blood covenant of him and God. It's incredible, no matter what. And we can put ourselves in these dry places, because we don't feel worthy, because we don't feel like we have a place at the table anymore, right? The condemnation comes. The enemy starts whispering in your ear saying, you're not worthy. You can't get this because you did that. God will never love you again. That's just not true, right? Okay, that was a little bit of a side journey. But anyways, all right. So, this is, I'll restore you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So what just happened here? Not only did Mephibosheth get the land of his grandfather, but now he's got a full staff serving him. (laughs) Right? So Ziba and all of his kids and all of his servants are now servants of Mephibosheth. They're working his land, they're getting him food, they're taking care of his house and all that stuff. This all happened in a matter of, what, 10 minutes? <laughs> How quickly everything just changed, right? It's like, he, he won the lottery. <laughs> all right, so. Um, all right, number 11, or verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. So he agrees to do that. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Verse 12, Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. Wait, he's got a son now? How old was he when he fled? But now he's got a son, right? So we know there's a long stretch of time that happened here. Um, so, at five years old, he's been in Lodabar, this dry place, for a long time, right? Now, I don't know if I remember much from when I was five years old, um, 
but I do know my new little nephew remembers everything, and he's five years old. <laughs> like everything, he remembers everything, okay? And so I imagine Mephibosheth, while he was in his dry place, remembered times in his past where he wasn't always in that spot, right? There's like flashes or something. That like he, he wasn't always here. And remember, his nurse was with him. So I imagine since he was lame in both feet, she would have to stay with him for a long period of time, right? Because there's no way he can take care of himself, probably. What kind of things do you think the nurse said to Mephibosheth about David? What's that? Hopefully good. good. Now remember, his nurse was living a pretty good life too, right? She was living in the king's household and all that, and now she's in this dry place too. I imagine she got a little bit bitter. Probably told him a few things about David that we won't want to repeat, right? So Mephibosheth probably has this skewed or altered view of who David is. Because he didn't know about the covenant. He's living in fear. He's living like a lot of us live, or how all of us lived before we came to Christ. Fearful. If I walk into church today, God would strike me dead. <laughs> I've heard that a few times, right? <laughs> but no idea of the covenant, no idea of what's happening there. So, Yep, I'll get there. All right. So, um, Mephibosheth had a son. Verse 13, we'll finish out chapter 9. So, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually. Continually meaning daily or evermore. So, he perpetually ate at the king's table for the rest of his life. And he was lame in both of his feet. They put that in there again. I don't know why, but they wanted you to know that he was lame in both of his feet. I assume that people who were lame in their feet would not normally have a seat at the king's table. I haven't quite studied that out yet, and now that I mentioned it, I, I need to do that, so I won't go there yet. <laughs> All right, so this is that place where I can kind of go a bunch of different directions, all right, and I think I know which way to go, all right. Um, so the, the other way is, you know, kind of what I've been alluding to before. You know, we have a new standing with Jesus because of the covenant. We sit at the king's table. You know, we're eating steaks. We're eating, you know, prime rib and all that stuff at the king's table. We're not eating ramen and all that stuff anymore, you know, <laughs> in that dry place where we once were. Um, so, yeah. Um, Ms. Belinda, can you put up the next slide for me, please? All right, this is the same desert, the Atacama Desert. It looks a little bit different now, right? What's there that wasn't there before? Life, flowers, right? It's the same dry desert that hasn't had rain in some places ever. In some places they get maybe less than like two inches of rain a year, if that. Some places it doesn't rain for decades. How is this able to happen? First of all, what do you have to have to have flowers? Water and seed, right? Got to have seeds. Seeds are pretty delicate, right? Without the right conditions, a seed won't grow and it can die. These flowers and, and this vegetation that is in this desert has evolved over time uh, to where their seeds form basically like this wax hard coating around those seeds. And so it allows them to survive for years and decades even. And as soon as water hits that wax, it basically dissolves the wax, it gets to the seed, and it's able to sprout. That's pretty incredible, right? It's pretty amazing. Uh, that they're able to do that. Um, so, seeds, in this, the, even though, you know, when we saw that first picture of all that dry, cracked land, there are seeds still in the ground, lying dormant, waiting for what? Water. 
waiting for something. Okay? And as soon as it gets that water, it shoots out of the ground in just a few days. Like, this happens within, like, I think 48 hours you get this from, like, after a rain, from death to this wonderful, beautiful, there's even better pictures out there that, um, anyways, just look at it. It's really incredible. Um, but it, really, this happens only about, like, averages about every seven years. Um, but it's pretty incredible if you get to see it. Um, Okay, so talked about, you know, we've all been in dry place. Uh, and again, with Mephibosheth, you know, I can't, can't help but think of him like in this dry place, in this desert almost, um, the same way as these seeds, right? Because over time, those seeds develop that hard outer shell, right? And I kind of imagine Mephibosheth and maybe his family and all those around him kind of had the same thing towards David, right? They've kind of built up this resistance and all that, and... When we get into a dry place, I know for me, you kind of start doubting a little bit, right? Not so much that, you know, Jesus is Lord and salvation and all that stuff, but doubting is like, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this where I'm supposed to be? Am I doing what I need to be doing, right? So a perfect example that I can think of that in my life is when I actually moved out here to Greensboro. As you know, Jess and I met at Rama uh, back in 2013. 2012? 2012. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we got engaged in 2013, the next spring. Um, and then, you know, we're getting close to graduation and got to figure out, you know, like, you know, we're engaged. Do I come out there? Does she stay here? That sort of thing. But I kind of always knew that I was supposed to come out here. Um, for whatever reason, just knew that's what I was supposed to do. And so we had graduation. Her and Shannon and uh, everybody left back out to North Carolina. I was going to come back, what, about a month later? Yeah, I had a wedding I had to go to and a lease I had to fulfill and all that stuff. And so I was going to come out here in about another month. And so when that time came, I packed up everything I could into my little Chevy HHR. Not very big. <laughs> but it was cram-packed with all of my earthly possessions at that point and drove from Tulsa to Greensboro. Had no place to stay, <laughs> didn't have a job, had no idea what was going to happen, right? Um, so, I actually had a friend of mine who I was in Cuba with, um, his name is Noah, he's an air traffic controller here in Greensboro, and so he, I don't know if that was God-ordained or what, but he was living here and he let me stay at his place until we got married, which was awesome, um, but I still got here and had no job. <laughs> And I looked for about a month, probably, probably about a month, just anywhere. It didn't matter where, just trying to find a job. Um, my savings was getting very, very low. I was just about out of money. And then I get two interviews, one with Shoe Carnival up there on Wendover and the other with the Salvation Army. And Shoe Carnival was going to pay me quite a bit of money to be a manager. Um, benefits, all that good stuff. But I had to work every Sunday. And that's very, very hard whenever you're in the pastor's family. <laughs> right? Okay. So, Salvation Army. The pay was significantly less. It was a part-time job. No benefits. Pretty much minimum wage. But they're closed on Sundays. And they closed before church on Wednesdays. Hard decision. Do I support myself or stay faithful? Right? So I took the job at Salvation Army. Now, part time, minimum wage, not making a whole lot of money. Two weeks after I started, a position opened up at another store at Salvation Army down the street up on Elm um, for assistant manager. When I was at Rama, I worked as assistant manager at Radio Shack and a shoe store, both. So I had management experience and all that stuff. Went into interview there. I was like, there's no way they're going to pick me because there's other people, you know, um, interviewing for this that have worked for the Salvation Army for years. I got it. 
is incredible, right? How does that happen? <laughs> so I get a pretty significant increase in wages. Now I have benefits, I have health care, retirement, all that good stuff, right? Um, that's still not a whole lot of money. It's, you know, it's a 501c3. It's a private organization, so they can't pay a whole lot, but it was enough. So, worked there for about, what, three years? Two and a half, three years? Something like that. <laughs> Two and a half or three years. And um, it kind of started getting to where um, I knew that's not what I wanted to do, obviously. You know, it was kind of a, it's supposed to be a temporary thing. Oh, I finished my degree and then I was going to go, you know, teach or do something else and all that. Um, well, I got my degree. I finished it up pretty quickly. I actually finished it up before we got married. And um, so I started looking for teaching jobs. So for that whole time, basically, I'm at Salvation Army. I'm looking for jobs teaching. And I cannot get one. Because um, my degree is not in teaching. My degree is in history. And they want people who have been through the educator training and all that stuff. Uh, basically, what I was trying to do was called lateral entry, which is, especially for social studies, very hard to do. So, nobody wanted me. <laughs> but I remember on that, while I was in the truck for the Salvation Army going up and picking up donations, like I'd go around all Greensboro picking up donations and bring them back and all that stuff, almost every day I drove by a high school. It was Page High School. And I kept driving by it, kept driving by it, and one day I just said out loud, that's the school I'm going to work at one day. Don't know why I said it. The guy beside me was like, okay. <laughs> it just kind of came out, you know? And then from that point on, every time I passed that high school, I just said that I'm going to work there one day. So a few years later, <laughs> still not working there, I finally started getting some interviews for a teaching position. Uh, Northeast, a middle, some middle school, I can't remember which one. I think it was Penn Griffin. Um, anyway, some, some, all these other schools, and none of them hired me. And so I started getting discouraged. You know, I'm in that dry place, and again, I'm starting to think, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Um, and then one day I get a call from GCS HR, and they said, hey, we're having this hiring fair up at this other school. You know, come up there with your resumes and all that stuff and all that. So I was like, okay. So I went up there, had no idea what's going on. I start interviewing, there's like two rounds of interviews. They interview you there, and then they send you to a school to go interview there, and then they make the decision and all that stuff. So I was like, okay, cool. Um, so I get through that first round, and then they said, okay, go to Page High School, you have an interview there. And I was like, what? <laughs> okay, so I go to Page, I get there. Now, yeah, no, I have no idea what education is about. <laughs> I just think you go in there and you start teaching kids, listen, they love you, yeah, you know, all that stuff. It's not like that <laughs> at all. Um, but there's certain things they want you to know. <laughs> I didn't know any of them, all right? And so I go in there and I'm, I'm talking to the principal and an assistant principal and another assistant principal. They're asking me all these questions and I'm like, I have no idea <laughs> how I'm supposed to answer this question. And so I got through that interview I don't know what happened, but they liked me. Now, they were obviously, you know, I didn't have the experience, any of that stuff. Um, they called me back for another interview there with the social studies department. Like, so there's like three people from the social studies department, and they're asking me all these questions. Same thing. I have no idea what's going on. But I go on my merry way. I don't hear anything back for about three weeks. And so I was like, well, guess not. Work in Salvation Army, working at the store, I get a phone call from a number I don't know. And normally I don't answer numbers that I don't know. Like, I just, if they want to get a hold of me, they can leave a voicemail and I can call them back, all that stuff, right? So I decided to answer it. It's the principal of Page High School. They said, hey, um, we know you interviewed a little while back. Uh, we filled that position um, basically with somebody who's just out of college, had, you know, uh, student teaching experience and all that stuff, which I can't blame them. You know, I mean, that's what they got to do. I said, but we have a half-time position opened up that may turn into full-time if you want to come and, you know, we like to talk to you again. So I went and did that. Long story short, I started Page High School 2015, 
16, yes, 2016 election, that's right. So yeah, 2016, part-time, so I'm only teaching three classes. Within two weeks, it's full-time, and I'm a full-time teacher. Right? So through all that, it was tough. Jess had gotten laid off from her job. So it was my income, that Salvation Army income, and it was not going very far at all. Um, and so it was tough. Uh, and there were times where I started thinking about, is this really where I need to be, right? Do I need to be here in Greensboro? Do I need to be here struggling when I can go back home? And I know plenty of places that will hire me, basically. But something inside of me just, you know, I kept being reminded about, you know, there's a point on my trip out here where I stopped somewhere in Tennessee for the night. And what's that? West Memphis, that's right. Don't ever stop in West Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> at least at night. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I was there that night. And I just remember, you know, God telling me something. I'm not going to repeat it here, but, you know, he told me something. And I just kept remembering that. And that was the confirmation that I knew I needed to be here. And so here we are today. Now, do we still go through dry places? Absolutely. We do. Um, but it's in those dry places that people make bad decisions. They make decisions to leave a church. They make decisions to go away from what they know and what they know they should be doing. Don't let a dry place dictate your future. Because if you do, you'll stay there. Does that make sense? If Mephibosheth had heard that these men were coming for him, he could have fled again, right? And he could have gotten away. We don't know. He could have. But where would he have been? Still in a dry place, right? Even when they did capture him, he could have gone up to the king and started cursing him out for everything wrong that he did and how he ruined his life and all this other stuff, but he held his tongue, right? He submitted and said, if this is it, this is it. And he was blessed for it. You have seeds you've planted in your life, right? Whether they're financial, whether they're through your faithfulness, whether they're through your worship, your praise, whatever it is, you have sown seeds throughout your life. And if, it's not a, if it hasn't harvested yet, that means it's still coming. Those seeds may have a little bit of a waxy coating on them, waiting for the right time to bloom, right? But you have to stay faithful and you have to stay committed to bring those seeds to fruition. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, all that to say, the dry place does not dictate your future. Don't let the dry place dictate your future. There's a way out of it. Yeah. Right? Um, I'm going to uh, kind of finish here with a quote. Um, of course, again, history, I love quotes. <laughs> um, this is attributed to Abraham Lincoln. Um, not for sure if he actually said it, but there's no record that he didn't. <laughs> this is not the, you know, don't believe everything you hear on the internet, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> no, but he said... I have noticed that most people in this world are about as happy as they have made up their minds to be. I have noticed that most people in this world are about as happy as they have made up their minds to be. It's pretty powerful, right? We have a choice. We have a choice to live and stay and have the dry place mindset, or we can shout and praise our way out of it. Amen? Remain faithful, don't lose heart, keep confessing the word, and keep praising. In your driest of places, wherever you are, there are still seeds that have been planted, whether it's through faithfulness, finances, prayer, or whatever. There is never a place that stays lifeless when you are walking with God. There is never a place that stays lifeless when you are walking with God. Evidence right here, right? Never a place. 
Just like Mephibosheth, he will bring you out of nothing town onto the king's table. Guys online, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, be sure to join us next week. Pastor Ed will be back. Uh, we love you and appreciate you guys' faithfulness. You guys have a great day.